Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Daily Gray Refuel, where we recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Dan. This is Sono, and today's the 29th of June, 2022. Alright everyone, let's get into it. So apologies for yesterday or for missing yesterday's episode. Unfortunately, uh, I'm still sick. I've been sick for almost a couple of weeks now. It's just a really stubborn cold. And yesterday my throat was very sore and just talking hurt. So uh, obviously couldn't do a refuel in that case, but still put out a newsletter. As you can see here, the Daily Gray TV account uh, tweeted out the kind of link to my newsletter from yesterday. Today. Uh, but yeah, uh, glad to be back today. It's a fair bit to get through over the last couple of days. I'm going to be doing that. Uh, but in, in the future, if I miss an episode uh, just randomly, it's usually because of something like that. And if you want an, an update, you can just go to the Discord channel. I put it in the announcements channel that I wasn't going to be able to do the refuel. So if you're looking for basically what happened, you can go in there and you'll be able to find the information uh, just for future reference there. But anyway, on to the rest of the stuff that I'm going to get through today. So just a, a heads up here that I have a, another uh, kind of like Twitter spaces happening as part of the merge series that I'm doing with SSV Network. This one is with Ben Edgington, who a lot of you will know as the creator, author uh, of um, What's New in ETH2, their newsletter there. Also uh, works at Consensus on the Teku Consensus Layer client and also is working on an, uh, a book covering kind of like ETH2 and all the other upgrades coming with it there. So I'm going to be interviewing him on the Twitter spaces uh, and you can kind of like check out the time here. It's going to be on the 1st of July at 9 a.m. UTC. You can do the conversion. For me, it's I think 8 or 9 p.m. on, on Friday night for me. Uh, but yeah, depending where you are in the world, obviously it'll be a different time zone there. And then I'm also earlier than that doing one with Stani. This was supposed to happen last week, but there were scheduling issues. So I'm still doing my interview with Stani on Twitter spaces. And that one is before Ben, it's a day before, I think at a slightly different time though. But you can go to the SSV network Twitter uh, kind of like handle here and scroll through and you'll be able to find when that's scheduled there. And of course, these will be recorded and I'll link the recordings in uh, the uh, Discord channel as well when they're up there. But yeah, I'm looking forward to my chats with Stani and, and Ben here. I think it's cool because they're both like very different. Uh, you know, obviously Stani spends a lot of time building in DeFi, whereas someone like Ben spends a lot more time on the on the kind of like core protocol side of things. So it's going to be interesting to get both of their views on the merge, on Ethereum generally, and see what they have to say. So looking forward to that and hopefully you 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 guys are too. All right, so we have the Grey Glacier hard fork, uh, which delays the difficulty bomb by two to three months, scheduled to happen on at 3 a.m. PT on June 30th. Now, it was said that it was scheduled for June 29th, but I guess like that was kind of uh, uh, the, the rough estimate because of the fact that block times are getting longer due to the difficulty bomb. So it's always hard to kind of like get the right estimation in that environment. But 3 a.m. PT on June 30th is, is, is when it should happen. Around 3, I mean, as I said, it's, it's hard to get the exact estimate here. Um, and right now, uh, if you go to ethernodes.org, you can kind of like check out uh, who's upgraded. I'll just bring that over here. Uh, so we've got 62% of the network upgraded. I've had a few people talk to me about this or ask about this. And it's like, isn't this a concern? No. Like this always happens. People just forget to upgrade their nodes. And then once they get kicked off the network, they upgrade them and then all is well. I think what really matters is the economically relevant nodes. And what I mean by this is economically relevant nodes are things like infrastructure providers. So for example, an Infura or an Alchemy uh, or kind of like um, in, I guess, like the consensus layer uh, 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 world, um, which is kind of like the big and chain world, it would be the staking service providers, things like that, uh, exchanges, right, uh, just wallet services, all that sorts of stuff. As long as they're kind of like upgraded, uh, it's, it's, you know, it, 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 it's fine. But again, like, it, the thing is, is that this, this actually goes into a deeper conversation around how Ethereum does its governance process. The economically relevant node, just because it's you know they're they're obviously very important within the network, doesn't mean they have control over the network. Like this is this is just a difficulty bomb delay. It's nothing else. It's nothing controversial. Like no one's against this, right? Um, but if it was a, a proposal or if it was a, a network upgrade or a hard fork to change something on the network that people were against, then these economically relevant nodes are basically in the minority. And they're not going to change what software they're running unless that the whole community has come to an agreement on, on it. Unless they, they know that there's kind of like a consensus on it. So it, it don't just take me saying the economically relevant nodes updating as being kind of like uh, me implying that Ethereum has like some centralization stuff, stuff around it. No, what really kind of like determines it is if there's any kind of like contention. And there's no contention around Gl Grey Glacier because it's literally just a difficulty bomb delay for a couple of months or two to three months until we get to the merge, hopefully. Uh, and then, you know, we kind of continue on from that but you'll see this number basically update very quickly once the i guess network upgrade goes through uh because of the fact that people will just notice that they got kicked off the network and they'll, they'll update their nodes there but just a reminder to update your node if you haven't yet you have less than 24 hours uh at this point so definitely get that done 
All right, so the uh, uh, finalists of the ETH New York were announced by ETH Global on Twitter the other day. So here are your kind of like 10 finalists that you can kind of, I guess, go through the thread and see each of them and see what they've built and, and everything like that. I always love kind of like seeing these things. You know, some of them, the thing is, most of these things don't go on to become like the next big project, but some of them do. And there's been a lot of projects in Ethereum that have been born out of these hackathons especially through ETH Global. And that's why I always like paying attention to this sort of stuff. And, you know, even if the the kind of like thing that was built doesn't go on to become a bigger product, it can influence other products. There are things from uh, from these kind of projects that have been built that can influence other products to implement those features. They can influence other kind of like ideas and, and go on further from there. And it also just gets more people involved with building on Ethereum, right? Like these people don't necessarily have to start their own project. They can have this hackathon on their resume, and have their project on the resume and then go to another existing kind of crypto company or Ethereum company and say, hey, like I was a finalist at ETH New York. This is what I built. You know, this is what I can do, blah, blah, blah. And, and that obviously counts for a lot when going for a job. So there's a lot of first and, and second order effects that come from from this. And, and it's not it, it doesn't mean anything if the project doesn't go on to kind of like become a bigger thing. As I said, most of them don't, but it's really, really good for people who are, who, especially younger people who are trying to break into this industry for them to, I, I guess, kind of like uh, get their foot in the door here. So so if that's something that you're interested in, definitely check out more of, I guess, like the ETH Global hackathons. They do tons of them each year. And as I said, like, it's really good to have it on your resume. Even if you just participated, that's that's better than than nothing, right? But if you do make it to being a finalist, that is looked upon very, very highly uh, by kind of uh, teams that are hiring out there. So yeah, definitely good to have. But I'll link this in the YouTube description and you can go kind of check out all the finalists here for yourself and see what they built. All right, so Rocket Pool's next release, codenamed Redstone, is, uh, as they described here, an exciting new chapter in the Rocket Pool journey here. So this is a big upgrade coming to Rocket Pool to get the, I guess, like Rocket Pool network ready for the merge. Now, you can read, I guess, like this blog post here for all of the information about this. What I like about Rocket Pool's blog posts when they kind of like um, do blog posts on their upgrades is that they're very detailed. They don't skimp on the details. Sometimes you'll have projects that they put, well, a lot of the times you actually have projects that put out a, an update or put out a blog post and they'll just basically give you marketing spec they won't actually dive into any of the technical stuff whereas rocket pool doesn't do that they obviously there's some marketing speak in there as there always is but they do dive into the te technical stuff they describe their thinking around it they describe kind of like what's changing what's happening and it gets me, it personally gets me more excited than just reading the marketing fluff, right? So included in this upgrade is a bunch of really cool features such as priority fee distribution. So obviously post merge, all of the unburnt fee revenue will now be going to validators instead of miners. And this is not locked. This is not uh, limited by the fact that there's no withdrawals on the beacon chain yet. You can actually access these funds. So if you're earning fee revenue, you can access that, you can sell it, you can kind of like add it to your ETH stack, you can restake it if you if you want, right? Through Rocket Pool, obviously. And and this is kind of like the Redstone upgrade will bring this to, to Rocket Pool here, this fee distributor and a like mechanism, which is their answer to how to handle fee distribution within the Rocket Pool network. There's a new reward system. So node operators in the Rocket Pool uh, protocol obviously are required to stake RPL as an insurance policy. Well, now there are a bunch of, I guess, uh, uh, upgrades coming to this reward system, especially around gas efficiency as well, which should help out the smaller stakers uh, here, uh, here, which is very, very cool. Uh, a smoothing pool, uh, which is an opt-in feature that will collectively pull the priority fees of every member opted into it. This is a way to effectively eliminate the randomness associated with block proposals on the beacon change. So just basically a fairer way to smooth out that fear of a new as part of the rocket pool network uh, and a bunch of other features as well here. So this will be hitting the Robston uh, test net. I think it's already there. We've deployed rocket pool to Robston and implemented the redstone upgrade. Yes, but which is being tested. So it's already live on the Robston test net if you want to get involved there with all the testing all the details are here and you can of course jump into their discord channel which as i've said before is one of the best out there definitely join the rocket pool community if you haven't yet if you're looking for a new home a new community that are basically all in on ethereum all in on on staking you you literally can't go anywhere else you have to go to rocket pool right like that's it's just an, it's such an amazing community but definitely recommend you give this blog post a read because it's got all the details you need to know what's coming in the redstone upgrade i'm super excited for it uh i think that you know rocket pool I mean, I've said this so many times to you guys. They're just, just, just such an legit team, such a legit project. Has been have been building for so long. They didn't just come at the top of the bull market to build something, right? They've been building since 2017, I believe. Um, and you know, I, I think they're doing it in the right way. And they've had to deal with a lot over the years. But it's it's really awesome to see how close we are to basically 
I was in the merge happening and then withdrawals happening and then Rocket Pool can, ba- can can kind of like take advantage of all that as well. And we can keep spinning up more and more uh, nodes so we can kind of, I guess, get dominance away from some of the other liquid staking providers such as Lido, for example. So really awesome to see this. Definitely go check it out. I'll link it in the YouTube description. All right, so speaking of ETH staking, Oisin from, oh, Oisin or Ashin? I think I did this last time where I, I mispronounced the name here. But anyway, uh, he put out a kind of like update that uh, they released a Sharon V0.7 update for the Obal network. So this release coincides with the launch of their Shining New Landing page, which you can also check out here. So just a refresher, Obal is a distributed validator network on Ethereum. They're building uh, kind of like ways to do distributed validation across different kind of like staking service providers or on your own. And you can kind of like find out how that all works and everything about that on their fresh new website here, which I think looks really, really cool. I actually love a good new website, especially when it's updated to just have the information front and center. As you can see here, as I'm scrolling down, immediately it's just showing how distributed validators kind of like work here in a really easy kind of way and really easy and digestible way to, to understand here. So definitely go check out the, the new website. But uh, Obal is another, I guess, project that I'm super excited about that's going to be more relevant post-merge and, and obviously when withdrawals are enabled here in order to kind of like de- further decentralize out uh, Ethereum staking. Obviously, there are concerns around centralization with Ethereum staking right now, specifically with regards to liquid staking providers. But I've said to you guys before that I think that the two biggest solutions to them is more competition, which is what Rocket Pool, Obal, and a bunch of other uh, kind of like... Um, providers bring and also uh, withdrawals being enabled on the beacon chain, but that's further out. So what we can do today is uh, bring more competition online. And also, I mean, there's a third thing there as well, which is the social signaling, but I've gone through this before and I don't think the social signaling is as powerful as we we, we, we can we can hope. Uh, I think the social layer works way better um, as a last resort rather than like kind of, kind of like a first resort. But at the same time, what, what it works as, as a first resort is kind of like getting the word out, you know, making people aware of these things so that they can maybe make a conscious decision to not go with something like Lido and instead go with Rockapool, right? If they're looking to stake. So I think that plays a really, really nice part there. And I hope people keep doing it. There's obviously a bunch of people that are that are tooting this horn, but I'm personally like much more interested in seeing what the network looks like post withdrawals because of the fact that I, I of that great reshuffling that I've spoken about numerous times. I know people kind of like disagree with me on this in, 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 in some parts, but Look, there's not that much kind of like competition out there in the staking ecosystem today, guys. Like, really, there isn't. And and as I said, like the beacon chain is like a half complete thing. Um, you know, it doesn't have the mer- it's not merged with the um the ETH one network and beacon chain withdrawals still aren't enabled. So it's it's not really in its end state at all. Not even pretty much pretty uh, not even um, close to its end state yet. But once it is, then we can see what Ethereum staking will actually look like. And I I really do think that it's going to look a lot more decentralized and a lot more distributed than it has been in the past, especially because uh, at the moment, everything's just up only. Like whoever puts ETH into something, if you put ETH into Rockapool, if you put ETH into Lido, if you put ETH into any of these providers, yes, you get the the kind of like liquid token back like RETH or STETH, for example, and you can sell that. Uh, for either at a discount or sometimes at parity, just depending when it is. But you can sell that and exit your stake. But the thing is, the ETH is still on the beacon chain because it can't be withdrawn. So it's literally up only. And the only way that the share of the network gets diluted is if you go with a different provider. So once those withdrawals are enabled, I'm actually very, very curious to see how many people pull out of something like Lido and go to another provider. Because by that point, we I mean, we hope a lot of these other providers are going to be much more mature than uh, than kind of like they are today. So yeah, anyway, enough ranting about that there. Definitely check out Obel's new landing page. I'll link it in the YouTube description. All right, so speaking of new uh, websites here, L2Beat have launched their governance forum and they already have a proposal live for you to discuss. Uh, so here you can see kind of, I guess, like their, 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 their proposal. So reworking how Total Value Locked works on L2Beat. Now, I've spoken about Total Value Locked or TVL a bunch of times on the refill before. And, you know, uh, uh, it, the, the post starts here by saying TVL is one of the most controversial and at the same time, one of the most used metrics to, access, uh, to assess the popularity of a chain reason it's most controversial is because it doesn't really tell you anything, right? Like, I remember back in the day when TVL came to popularity, it was basically around Ethereum DeFi, and then DeFi 
There was originally a website that would show you the TVL in kind of like a DeFi protocols on Ethereum. A lot of it was obviously in MakerDAO. I think over 90% was in Maker. And then uh, as time went on, all the DeFi protocols came online and, and there was more of a share there. But bef- And then uh, DeFi Pulse basically uh, popularized it. It was it was kind of like a niche Ethereum tool that people would use to track these sorts of th- stuff. But then DeFi Pulse came out and popularized it. And then it became a, a kind of big measuring stick for the Ethereum community. But the thing is, then it became what everyone used. And then liquidity mining came along and people were like, okay, well, if you can just get billions of dollars into a protocol, which just go, which just exits three months later, once the liquidity mining runs out, then does TVR really mean anything? And then we looked for better ways to, I guess, kind of uh, uh, assess the activity on a chain and fear of a new came to prominence. And I, I still believe fear, fear of a new is the best measure we have because of the fact that it's extremely hard to fake because it's expensive to fake. Um, but there's a bunch of other things as well, like active addresses, right? Uh, active users of, of kind of like wallets, uh, you know, d- different kind of like NFTs that people collect, uh, especially people that are kind of like active at collecting them uh, and any kind of like uniqueness that you can tie to an address and stuff like that, right? So this foreign post basically goes over that. It's like, okay, TVL is, is shitty. It's not, re- it's not great. Let's see what else we can do. And there's kind of like, you know, TVL versus AUM, so assets under management, like how many assets are under management here, which is, I guess, very similar to to TVL, kind of like reporting on things like supply of tokens and how the, the native token plays into it, for example, filtering out, you know, small cap tokens that are easily, easily manipulated in terms of market cap uh, and, and things like that. So this discussion uh, has a few great posts here. You can get involved with it if you'd like, but I definitely think that we need to, as an industry, stop using TVL as any kind of like measuring stick. I actually think it's it's probably one of the worst at this point in time, because a me- like there's this saying that basically says when the target become, sorry, when a measure becomes a target, it sees it ceases to become a good measure or something like that. I, I butchered the phrase, but you get my kind of like point here. It's just not something that gives us any signal anymore. It's just all noise to me. And we need to look at other things. I, as I said, I personally look at fear of a new, because of the fact that it's very hard to to kind of like fake. And I think that fear of a new gives you over the longer term, a more consistent view on how the the chain is growing and how the chain is kind of like faring and whether it's 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 kind of like faring well in bull markets only or faring well in all market conditions. You know, for example, obviously ETH's uh, fee revenue has gone down a lot because the bull market subsided, but it still is processing four or five million dollars a day worth of worth of fees. Right? Obviously, that's not the tens of millions we saw during the bull market, but it's still a lot, and it's still a lot more than than its kind of like next closest competitor. So, if I bring up cryptofees.info here for you, just to show you what I mean, right? Let's compare it to other blockchains, not not apps, because I've just, just discussed why we why we shouldn't do that before. So, let's just compare it to layer one and layer two. All right, Ethereum over the last seven days did four point three million dollars of uh, of revenue, right? A- on average, right? Binance Smart Chain is coming in second here at six hundred thousand dollars, which is obviously considerably less than Ethereum. And then after that, you have Bitcoin, which is half of what BSC is, and then you have uh, Arbitrum, Avalanche, and, and Polygon, and a bunch of other chains here. But it basically collapses here. So Ethereum by far is the most used chain when we're, when looked at uh, when looking at it in terms of kind of like fear revenue generated here. And then BSC in second, Bitcoin third, and then uh, you know a bunch of kind of like other chains here. But a classic example of, I guess, bull market fear when users is also something like Avalanche, for example. And I know Avalanche is a bit more nuanced here because of the fact that the uh, thing that was accounting for most of its fear when you actually moved off the network and onto its own subnet. But you can see here that if one app causes uh, such a steep decline in fear when you, well, that's pretty bad. Like you can see here on... May 11th, uh, uh, Avalanche was doing $1.3 million of fear revenue for that day. And then by May 14th, it was only doing 100000 So it collapsed 90% in three days because one app left the chain. And then since then, it's just been trending down. Now, Avalanche was a classic example of a chain that did a big liquidity mining program during a bull market, and that's where a lot of their fear of you came from, and it wasn't sustainable. I mean, I think I mentioned on the refill that I didn't think it was sustainable, and I can kind of like sort out here and show you. You, you, you can see it here, right? Like, I think around August is when they started their liquidity mining program. Uh, probably a little bit earlier than that. And then, it, you know, during this was kind of like the peak of the bull. And then they, and then obviously this was the bear here, but that was still kind of, uh, during this period, there was still that kind of like one game or some crab game that accounted for a lot of the fear revenue. Then that moved off and a collapse here. So, you know, there's, there's different kind of things here. And I think that you can't just look at, at fear revenue 
in a vacuum. You can't look at fear revenue as a kind of like a day-to-day or week-to-week. You need to look at it month-to-month to get a really good, and sometimes even year-to-year to get a good picture because bull markets can distort that fear revenue given that everyone is paying whatever because they're making lots of money. And that's why when you look at kind of something like Ethereum, obviously, as I said, Ethereum is down as well, right? I'm like, I'm not going to sugarcoat that. Ethereum is down a lot as well. But let's go back to June 2020. I think crypto fees goes back to that here. And let's look at what how the the evolution of, of kind of like Ethereum Ethereum's fair revenue here. I think it goes back to June 2020. So, you know, you can see kind of like how how kind of like sporadic it is and how volatile it is where you have like, I mean, not really, this, this was DeFi summer, which is funny enough, right? DeFi summer basically stayed at around what, one, two, three million dollars a day, uh, even just towards the end of 2020. And then you had 2021 where the bull market really got heated and we were in the 10, 20, 30 million dollars a day. And then it went absolutely crazy during kind of like uh, the, the, the top here, like hundred million dollars some days, right? Then once the bear market hit again, it kind of like crashed, like crashed a lot. We went back to a few million a day and then it heated up again. And then, you know, we came back down, obviously had this spike here, which I think was due to the other side NFT sale. But, uh, but yeah, it's still kind of like has hovering around four or 5 million now. So that, if you kind of like take the average, like this doesn't really take the, the, take the average. I think you can take the seven day average, but that's not really going to give you much either. Like if you took the 30 day or kind of like 60 day average or something like that, you'd probably average between five and 10 million uh, of revenue. And, and that's kind of like Ethereum, right? So you can see here yeah, how much bull markets and hot markets distort things for fear revenue. So that's why fear revenue, as as much as I love it as a metric, it should not be used in a vacuum at all. It needs to be used with everything else. Like, Active addresses, new addresses, uh, active addresses with a balance, you know, what they're doing on the chain, active users of something like MetaMask and all that sorts of stuff. So that's why, you know, L2B should be reworking TVL to track L2 metrics because TVL just gives you absolutely no signal in general. Uh, and, you know, no one metric will give you enough signal to kind of, I guess, like get a good picture of anything. So, so yeah, that's kind of like maybe my TLDR on what it means to measure activity on a blockchain. Uh, and maybe I, I think that ranking what is most important would be good to, a good exercise to do. Maybe L2B can do this. I think at the very top is definitely fair revenue. But then after that, it's kind of up for, deba- for, for debate what comes after that, especially in terms of like measuring it uh, over long periods of time and measuring it in such a way that it can't be gamed because you can always game a different metric. You can game active addresses on Ethereum, for example, very easily uh, and, you, and and even more easily on a, on a layer two because it's much cheaper to do it too. So it, there's just, you need to take all these kind of like things in aggregate. You can't just take things as like in a vacuum and that's how you get to, I guess, like measuring activity. But anyway, stopping it there because I've got a bunch of other things to get through, but I hope that was insightful for you. All right, so the data availability problem or data availability in general, uh, maybe something that you've heard about a lot over the last few months but in particular, and it is the kind of like lo- on the longer term roadmap for Ethereum, especially around things like data availability sampling and stuff like that. Now there's two threads that you can read to get like a better understanding of this today. One here from Henry going over the data availability problem and how it kind of, I guess, like applies to things like layer twos. And another tweet thread here from Pintable, uh, Pintail, who uh, uh, goes um, through what data availability sampling is and, and all the cool properties that come along with that. I'm not gonna go through the threads on the refuel, but I highly recommend giving these both a kind of read because this is gonna be talked about much more after the merge when we're leaning into the Shanghai update, which is obviously coming in uh, hopefully 2023, that gives us proto dang sharding and things like that. And then as time goes on to go to full data sharding, data availability sampling and data availability in general is going to become a huge, huge topic of discussion within the Ethereum community and something that you definitely need to be paying attention to if you're interested in core protocol work. So read these two threads. I'll link them in the YouTube description below for you. All right, so Chun here has put out an interesting tweet thread about Gitcoin Grants 2.0 and how uh, they believe it will be really, really huge. So I didn't actually know Gitcoin Grants 2.0 was a thing until I read this thread. I've been, uh, unfortunately, a little bit behind here. But basically, this is a 27-part thread going over what Gitcoin Grants 2.0 is, what the roadmap looks like, what its impact may be, and the opportunities that lie there. I think the TLDR, if I had to give it, was that Gitcoin Grants 2.0 is hopefully going to look a lot more decentralized than Gitcoin Grants. 1.0 and a lot more community involved and 
a lot more kind of like community ownership of things and and definitely kind of taking a modular approach here as you can see from the picture that uh, Jet Chun is, uh, has posted here. But again, uh, this is a 27 part thread so I'm not going to read it out on the refill. You should definitely go check it out. I believe the Geekcoin Grants 14 matching round has ended. Uh, so th again, just wanted to throw out a thank you to everyone who donated to me but also to everyone else there. I think it was a record round for Gitcoin, which is very, very cool to see considering it's a bear market. Obviously, Gitcoin is one of those things that Seems to do well no matter the market, I think. Bull or bear market, people want to give, want to donate to projects and public goods, want to support public goods. And that's always awesome to see because we definitely need more applications in Ethereum that aren't subject to the whims of bull and bear markets. Because as I just showed you before, if you just take fear of you as the metric of measuring activity, it's pretty much like most of it. I think the fear revenue is down like 90% from its peak on Ethereum. Uh, I, I think most of it uh, is definitely attributed to kind of like the bull market rather than just, than kind of like anything sustainable, right? Because obviously bull markets come and go, bear markets last longer, and 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 the thing is we need more better applications. And I've discussed this before on the refuel how I thought that we need just much better applications in general for for crypto, for blockchains. And I discussed how I think layer twos are going to enable that. But it's very, very awesome to see that Gitcoin is just so resilient and just so detached from market cycles. And it seems to do well no matter what the price is doing. So very cool to see that. All right, so another big thing you'll be hearing about uh, in the coming months is account abstraction. Now, I spoke about this on the refill the other day, but Argent has a great explainer thread here about what account extraction is and what uh, uh, and why you should care about it. Now, you can go read this thread. It's very, it's not a long thread. It's quite short. And obviously, Argent is a mobile wallet, so they know a thing or two about, I guess, like Ethereum accounts and how to do uh, how to kind of like uh, treat them properly and how to secure them properly and also how it works on layer twos with ZK Sync and Starknet. So definitely give this a read. I'll link it in the YouTube description. So uh, PMC Guhan here announced today that, uh, well announced, I guess yesterday, that they've launched a new product or a new website called ZeroMEV.org, which is a front running explorer. So you can now protect yourself and empower yourself by using this front running explorer to find a bunch of different things about uh, transactions that you may be submitting and transactions that other people have submitted. So there is a walkthrough video that you can watch on YouTube here and also a getting started website at info.zeromev.org to teach you how to use it. I think this is very cool. MEV is obviously one of the most important topics in Ethereum, if not the most important long-term kind of like topic and long-term concern in Ethereum because I've discussed it before, but there's a lot of toxic MEV that we need to try and eliminate, that we need to make sure that uh, doesn't kind of like cause instability on the network. And it's more of a longer-term problem. And there are the solutions like PBS and things like that that are coming Two and uh, speaking of MEV as well, you should definitely give a recent episode of Bankless a listen with Matt Cutler from Block Native. He gave a really really great podcast talking about all things you know mempool, MEV, a uh, bunch of different kind of like things that surround that. So you definitely check that out as well uh, if you want to learn more about MEV. But you should definitely check out zeromev.org if you're interested in diving deeper here too. All right, so Pseudotheos put out an interesting tweet the other day where he said, Rollups have a cost advantage. As a blockchain, paying Ethereum settlement costs for security is far cheaper than running a bespoke validator set. Now, this, I guess, goes back to what I was saying the other day when I talked about DYDX and how they were moving to their own app chain instead of kind of like staying on, on kind of like a as an Ethereum layer two. And I wrote about this in today's newsletter, so I'm not going to dive too deep into this. But what I wanted to say is that I think that it's just weird to me that people would still consider building their own chain when the costs associated with it, not just the um, the economic costs, but the social costs, the decentralization costs, the coordination costs are so much higher. I'm not talking about just like two times higher or three times higher. I'm talking about potentially hundreds of times higher than they would be if you just spun up a roll up. And the clearest example of this is... If you spin up your own chain, you have to pay for validators. You have to coordinate these validators. You have to try and decentralize them, and you have to pay them in the to via token inflation. And it and it costs a lot of money to spin up something like this. Whereas if you spin up a layer two on Ethereum, you can just start paying Ethereum layer one right in transaction fees as a normal kind of like a, a user would. And you can start offering more block space to your users and kind of like uh, scalability to your users. So from that point of view, like, why would you spin up your own option? Like, I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around this. And I know that Bankless did a podcast with Antonio from DYDX and there was discussion around that. I spoke, I, I didn't listen to it myself, but 
I had a TLDR given to me. And basically, Antonio apparently hand waves a lot of kind of like questions away or was very confident that he could solve a lot of these fundamental issues with app chains in a shorter period of time. But I just don't buy that. I, I really do think that Rollups, while they're, they're maybe considered immature today and they're still very early, they have a much better path to getting to where we want them to be than something like an app chain. And I think over the next few years, few years, this may become like a pretty big, uh, I guess, like ideological fight in the community. But at the same time, like you could imagine a world where DYDX launches their app chain and it goes nowhere. And that kind of like puts a nail in the coffin of the app chain thesis. Meanwhile, rollups keep kind of like growing. Rollups keep getting better. Obviously, they're getting better all the time and they're getting more scalable all the time. And you can imagine a world where they're just like much better than than app chains, leagues ahead of them before app chains even have a kind of like chance to to get remotely close to them. So anyway, I'm not going to go into that discussion again. You can definitely check out um, the video from the other day where I talked about the DYDX move uh, for more details on that. And you can check out today's newsletter too because I wrote about uh, this tweet from Pseudotheos. All right, so Joseph DeLong, CTO at Astaria, has put together a thread saying, uh, started by, he started by saying, a lot of people have been asking me what is Astaria and how does it work? In short, Astaria is an NFT lending protocol and Astaria has, has de developed the three actor model or 3AM. In 3AM, there is an appraiser, a borrower, and a lender. And you can basically give Joseph's uh, kind of like tweet thread a read here to kind of dive deeper into it. And he's got a little image here showing uh, kind of like how this all works as well. So I mentioned Astaria the other day and I did mention that I'm an investor in them as well. Um, but you can definitely check out Joe DeLong's thread here if you're still confused about what Astaria is, like how it works, how you can do NFT lending protocols and, and kind of like how it's kept safe and secure and all that good stuff there. So definitely go check out Joe's tweet thread. And finally here, Lyra Finance has introduced a uh, protocol upgrade called Avalon, which is a, as I say, a powerful upgraded version of Lyra protocol on Optimism here. So Lyra V1 uh, obviously has been out for a while now and Lyra, Lyra Avalon will be kind of like retaining the features of, uh, of V1 uh, and also adding a bunch of new features here. So if you want to check out everything that's coming there, you can basically check out this kind of like tweet thread for more information on that. But I'm not going to talk too much about it because I've gone over time here. So I'll link this in the YouTube description for you to check out, but that's going to be it for today. So thank you everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks everyone.